My name is Natalia, and I am a designer turned software engineer, so that means I get brought in to um, bridge that gap between design and development, or as some other people like to put it, like, please fix our CSS. And, uh, but I'm also an educator, and I am a career switcher into tech, so that means I get to see things from another perspective. Uh, and so from that perspective, what I can really tell is like, the work I'm being asked to do is to translate between mental models and make sure people with different skill sets can collaborate and help build the tools so that they can actually communicate. Um, so I've got to admit, like when I started writing this talk, I was like, let's talk about designers, developers, and the role that CSS plays in both. But uh, just like with everything in software, things are a lot more complicated than that. And there's a larger pattern here. Um, what I really need to talk about is the intersections between mental models and how your entire career trajectory can be shaped by how you respond at those intersections. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> let's talk about how CSS sits at this intersection. Uh, how do I know to make such a claim that CSS sits at an intersection? Well, the spirited debates about it are pretty much a giveaway. Um, we're still arguing if CSS is programming or not. Who should own it? Should a designer or a developer? Because both are writing it. And finally, um, we are still arguing um, about whether it's super intuitive and works as intended, or it's counterintuitive and extremely bad. So that means, yeah, it's sitting at an intersection. And I see it that CSS is actually incredible at kind of managing the complexity between these different mental models, um, we should be done arguing, but like this keeps just going. Like, why are we still arguing? Is it awesome or is it broken? Like, really, like, which one is it? So I gotta say, to an educator, the debates that happen at these intersections where skill sets meet are extremely predictable and not at all unique to tech. Um, so, like I said, I get to see things through a different lens, and I'd really like to invite you all to take a look at it with me. Um, disclaimer, I really love how people learn. Like, I love psychology. I spent my graduate school <laughs> experience just, I majored in creativity and talent development, which means it's all about how people learn, how potential gets translated into talent, and how we grow, uh, how we learn, and the many interventions that have to happen when learning veers off course. So to understand why things get so heated around CSS, um, we really have to take a look at like, how do people learn? And you know, we're not computer programs. We don't just take it line by line by line and absorb knowledge. Like if we did, that'd be amazing. But we don't. We construct patterns of like organized thought in our minds. Uh, as we get information, we either accommodate or assimilate that information, or we might reject it. Um, and, and just we, we, we keep constantly figuring out this mental model of like, how do things work? And that means prior knowledge is absolutely the key. That means every bit of new information you encounter has to interact with information that you already have, like this mental model construct of like, how does this thing work? And it's really important. That's why it's called your foundation. It informs a lot of things that happen from then on. So for example, someone who started studying programming with a rigid and mathy language like Haskell may find that JavaScript is complete chaos and just lets you do whatever, or someone who started with JavaScript and established a good working model of like, this is kind of how this works, uh, may find Haskell to be just like way too opinionated, way too rigid, and they find that like, no, JavaScript is the, the true flexible language that lets me do the things I need. Um, that's why someone who's like a designer learning CSS might say like, thinking globally is amazing, the cascade does what I need it to do, and like, declarative, yes. Whereas someone who's coming from programming learning CSS might say like, what's happening? We need some control flow. We need like scope everything immediately. And like this cascade chaos has got to go. Um, and also prior knowledge can actually interfere with new information as you take it in. So that's why I've seen you know, newcomers learn CSS grid faster, aspects of CSS grid faster than those who have to like put aside old assumptions about how layout on the web works. So that's <laughs> it's pretty interesting to, to consider. So in your work, you have this feeling of confidence and competence 
when you figure something out. When the first time you're like, really have something click and have it work out for you. Um, and that's a really good feeling. And then you try something new and something different outside of your comfort zone, and you expect it to work a certain way, and you're like, does something else. It breaks, and it, you have no idea what happened. You get these unpredictable things. It makes no sense, and you start thinking, why wouldn't someone make something so frustrating? This is clearly the wrong thing to do. And that's a bad feeling. And we really love avoiding that bad feeling of when we feel incompetent. Uh, but that bad feeling is actually called cognitive dissonance, and we need it to learn. <laughs> Um, cognitive dissonance is uh, basically the frustration you feel when your mental model is challenged, when your assumptions don't check out and you are stepping into a different way of thinking. And just like it is the foundation of learning, it's also a big barrier to learning because, uh, again, to an educator, the truest sign of an early learner is someone who rejects a new mental model and reacts poorly and blames either the tool, the framework, or, or the language, whatever it is, and never their own misunderstanding or uh, inability to shift to a new understanding. And that's totally fine. I am not judging because that's just like what happens when people learn. We all in this room feel cognitive dissonance at some point. The problem arises is when the many platforms on the internet can take those private learning frustrations and elevate them to the public sphere where they can do harm, where someone can have those private frustrations validated and encouraged and reinforced, and then they stay in that comfort zone and they don't venture out further. Uh, so it can do harm to both the individuals experiencing this cognitive dissonance and reacting in a frustrated way, but also to the larger community where newcomers are coming in and hearing really strongly worded messages that create really harsh and rigid barriers between frameworks or languages or job roles or job titles. Um, and it really limits people, it limits the industry, and perhaps that's why this gap between design and development that I often get brought into Bridge can feel so wide. Why people uh, get so siloed into narrow job roles and responsibilities, why languages like CSS keep being argued about whether it's broken or awesome, and why so many people get trapped in below average learning and or gatekeeping, that's even worse, they start keeping others out and reinforcing those boundaries for others. So that's really grim, <laughs> now that I've made everyone sad about it. Uh, let's, let's talk about actually how we can move forward out of it, because the really good news is that all of these barriers are completely arbitrary and self-imposed, and so we can do a lot to overcome them. Uh, so I'd like to share a story about one thing I do in my uh, Harvard Extension course, which I wrote a semester-long course called Modular Design Patterns for React, which uh, it's a semester-long course that I designed specifically for that intersection between design and development, and predictably, it attracted a very wide range of skills. I have everybody from like graphic designers to backend developers, and I've just, I'm taking everybody in. And we start by you know, doing things, and I assess like, what everyone's skill set, what everyone's strength is. And then a little bit through the semester, I sign a group project. And it has the same roles you would find on a small tech team. You've got your designers, developers, all this stuff, uh, where they have to come together and make a prototype except I give them one challenge. You have to pick the thing you're the worst at. So the JavaScript developer who's like 15 years of experience is now the graphic designer. It's like, good luck with the user experience. You're responsible for that. The SEO expert is now the Git maintainer for the team so that they have to make sure everyone is able to collaborate and contribute code <laughs> effectively. And the graphic designer on the team is now responsible for writing all of the markup and styles with a strong fo focus on accessibility. So after some panic and deep breaths, uh, you know, what we found was that people had a lot of fun. Because I made taking this risk risk-free and I encouraged shifting mental models, what you find is, one, people love to learn. People love stepping out of their comfort zone when there's a, an opportunity to do so safely. So their incomes weren't tied to how well they could do this. And the result, they found that they all got better at their jobs. They realized the impact of their own scope of work on the people that they're daily collaborating with in their you know, day jobs. And I feel like that's a really important point to 
to, to highlight. They got better at their own jobs by doing someone else's and stepping into that um, other mental model. And the thing is, this really translates to any industry. It is not specific uh, to tech. This is how learning works. Um, because those are who are able to practice flexibility tend to surpass those who repeatedly reject the challenge of other ways of thinking. Like, this is what I'm talking about. There is above average learning, and it takes deliberate effort. You cannot just dump a bunch of hours into doing the same thing and expect good results. Like, it, it takes a very specific practice of flexibility and challenging yourself and embracing that deliberate discomfort that comes with challenging your mental model, the cognitive dissonance. So that's why we have so many people in their industry called unicorns, because it's like, wow, you can do this and this other seemingly opposite thing? And it's like, well, there is really no reason for someone to have the title of a mythical creature if, if they're able to do two things. Like, these barriers are completely arbitrary. Um, so I embrace, embrace the challenge, embrace the cognitive dissonance, and start building the things that'll make everybody on your team empowered. Because once you figure it out, you're like, I've got preferences, I know what I'm doing, like, I've tried all the different things, and I know what works here, what works there, what works with the team I have, and suddenly you become someone who can not only do your best work, you can empower others to do their best work. And one of the best ways you can do that is by building tools for collaboration. The first thing you can do on your team anywhere is just take a look at who you've got on your team and how they're interfacing with each other. And so this problem is pretty common here. Like you get some design assets, some whoever's doing the work may make some wild guesses and then you get it in your application and you always find that in that gap things go missing. And it's really frustrating and it's because we need to create the tool, the interface that makes those two work. So the one of the most broadly effective ones you can create is a design system. You may hear a lot of folks talking about it. And so I want to just touch on a specific example of something you can do um, that's part of the broader system you can build that, that kind of integrates your product. Um, but it, it means like you have to respond to the needs you have. And one of the projects that I was brought in to help with once basically had uh, a designer who was a very strong designer, really strong HTML and CSS, but not so much on the JavaScript. And then we had a very strong JavaScript developer they were working with whose only real experience writing um, UI was implementing things like Bootstrap and just using libraries, not writing it themselves. And so how was I going like, to help this team come together on a complex like React application? Uh, what I didn't want was the designer to get pushed back in one direction and just only be responsible for just showing sketch files or design assets and the JavaScript developer having to be responsible for all the code. Um, I wanted to build this tool that would allow them to communicate. So the first thing is like, yeah, we got to get a style guide and we got to agree on conventions, we got to agree on our components and we have the documentation part of it. This is something that's probably very familiar to you all. You've seen the like, we've got these buttons, we've got these modals, here's our typography. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about this. What I'm gonna say is the next tool, the prototype tool that I built, um, which is just a private route in your dev, only accessible in the dev environment where your designer who may be, for example, if you have a designer who's less uh, proficient in JavaScript can still contribute at their preferred way. So here's an example. Um, if you can't read that, it'll be online. Um, who are, who's able to write just semantic HTML, focus on design patterns, focus on accessibility, focus on just getting the shape of this UI written, and then within that browser, within that special uh, route in your application, the developer can take that HTML and CSS, and you know what, let's actually connect it to the data. Let's include all of the abstractions of this library that I'm wanting to use that you know, that maybe the person trying to contribute code coming in just doesn't know yet. Uh, and we have a great uh, intersection there in that gap where you're not really writing the same code twice. What you're doing is you're making sure that the two different mental models of people's understanding can interface and you can have a much cleaner handoff. Leaves no gap to bridge and it's so much better to work with. Um, and, you know, doing these kinds of things is going to be unique to your team. There is no one way to do this. It's remembering you have to see where people's skill sets are 
and meet them there and enable them to be better. So in this case, uh, the designer got a lot better at learning to contribute more of the code in the abstractions of the application. And the developer was able to expand their skill sets and be like, oh, OK, well, that's HTML5. Got it. I can write it. I'm so much better at understanding these patterns as well. So it's also how you grow people and make them better. And the cool thing is you get to join the other people in this community working to make it better. Uh, it is so easy to just hear all these cries of like, CSS is broken. It's terrible, um, or hear just the people going on and on about how stuff just doesn't work right. Um, and it's better to just to be the one who's like, cool, well, well I'm going to build the tools to either empower my team or my community. And you, once you start looking for these things, you see them absolutely everywhere. You might not even notice you're looking at it. Like, for example, Sketch has a code export so that if you're just a graphic designer getting into code, you can see the language you can start using with the person who is maybe taking your assets and actually implementing these designs. So you can then start learning and moving towards that. Um, React could be this, to use you know, a popular library. Um, that's what's really happening there. And instead, they chose to do it like this, so that someone who knows HTML can write JSX today. And you know, uh, if you hear about styles in JS, you know that that community said, "Hey, we do owe a gr debt of gratitude to the folks pushing the boundaries in the other direction." It's quite a positive thing. Um, and then you know, we have Jen Simmons who collaborated with browser developers to create the awesome Firefox Grid Inspector tool, so that you can share that mental model of like, how does Grid work? How do I work with it? Uh, so these tools are being built, and they're incredibly powerful. So like, yeah, it can feel really loud um, and really negative at these intersections. And there is no chance that the battle between a CSS awesome or broken is ever going to go away. It's just part of how people learn that frustration they feel at the cognitive dissonance. And instead of getting super distracted by that, um, I would just urge you all to embrace the cognitive dissonance that comes with learning new things, practice that flexibility, because that is how you get above average learning. And then you can just be part of the community that builds the tools for collaboration, empowers people to get out of those arbitrary barriers between technology frameworks, job roles, um, and make a really positive impact on, at any scale, any team, any community that you choose. Thank you so much.